this lecture, we're going to be looking at new media. And what we're going to con con concentrate on is what we mean by new media and how that has developed over the last 100 years. The characteristics of new media, as identified by sociologists, how new media is used by different groups within society, focusing on class, gender, age, etc. And then we're going to look at the debate surrounding new media and its impact on society. So it's going to be a little bit um, debate, a little bit factual um, but the new media is really interesting because it is something that is impacting our lives constantly and it's constantly changing and it's constantly evolving so what do we mean by new media now just by its name you think oh it's just something that is new but we don't use the word in the definition so when we're explaining what we mean by new media we use the definition of types of media that use digital technology and the internet. And there are types of technology which are digital, um, but we now consider obsolete or um, out of date. So, as I say, it's a constantly evolving um, definition and what is considered new media. But we can narrow it down a little bit. So when we're talking about new media, we are talking about social media. We're talking about Facebook, Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. Um, we're talking about Instagram, Snapchat and all the different types of social media that are popping up and disappearing and coming back and going away. Um, we're talking about streaming services, music, movies, TV. Almost every channel now has a streaming service attached to it, ITVX, BBC iPlayer. Then you also have your subscription streaming services, Netflix, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Amazon Prime, um, just to name a few. And obviously within that, there are other channels that you can subscribe to as well. We're talking about digital satellite and smart TVs. Now, all televisions now are digital. There is no more analog television. All TVs have converted to digital. And that gives you more free um, channels to watch. And a lot of TVs now are smart TVs. I mean, the new Sky Glass, I don't know what that thing can't do. If you have a camera attached to it, it can map your body to make sure that you're doing yoga correctly, um, as well as just being a TV. Online computer games. Now, online computer games are considered new media. Computer games in general are not considered new media. They are considered traditional media because they don't necessarily they don't tend to use the Internet. So you're talking about your Xboxes, your PS5s, games that you can chat to multiple players on, um, but also things like um, Civilization and um, PC based gaming. And it's also apps for mobile phones and tablets. I mean, the number of apps that are available now, people are creating apps left, right and centre for lots of different services, health, education, cooking, um, communication, you name it, there's probably an app for it. Um, timers, you can get, um, I think I was watching an episode of Big Bang Theory where Howard gets a Bell app on his phone to summon Bernadette. So there are apps for everything. And finally, interactive TV where you can when you're watching sport by using the red button on BBC, you can change the perspective by what you're by which you're watching. You can interact, take part in polls and competitions through your TV. And Netflix now have at least two shows that I can think of where you get to choose your own movie. So at various points through the film, you can choose what happens next. So new media is massive and it is changing constantly.
And if we look at the history of it, we are only really going back to around the 1940s. So in the 1940s, they invented the transistor, which allowed data transfer between devices that underpin digital technology. Now, interestingly here, you've got an actress named Hedy Lamarr, and she was once named the most beautiful woman in the world. And it was her invention of frequency hopping transistors that uh, in the 1940s that led the way for Wi-Fi, led the way for the digital technology that we have today. So in between playing Delilah and Samson and Delilah in the 1940s, she was invent she was an amazing mathematician as well as actress, and she she is the mother of modern Wi-Fi. But as we go through, we've got um, the first email being sent in the 1970s. However, um, that was a within a um, lab scenario. It wasn't something that was commercially available. Commercial available internet and um, things like that weren't available until 1992. And you would have dial up where you would have to physically dial into the internet. And if you were using the internet, you couldn't use your phone line at home. And it made that horrible whirring noise. Um, you've got the internet itself was invented by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989. Uh, whilst he was at CERN, he was a British inventor. But again, it wasn't available commercially at this point. Um, in 1990, only half a percent of people had access to or were using the Internet. Uh, Bluetooth technology came in in 1999, broadband in 2000, and we start seeing the development of social media, YouTube, Facebook. All of those were the early 2000s. The first iPhone was 2007. So it's the iPhone's not even 20 years old yet. Um, Bitcoin 2011 and since 2016 we have seen a range of new technologies coming out that have launched more and more for versions of uh, new tech new media so what are the characteristics of new media so social sociologists and others who are studying the the um, phenomena of new media have identified a number of characteristics that can be used to kind of go that is new media it's not something else it's not new technology it's or just new technology it is media and the first one is digitization and what we're talking about here is the move away from analog transfer of data to digital um, data. So it's changed the way that information is stored, the way it's transmitted. And regardless of its format, when we're talking digitization, we are talking binary code, those ones and zeros, all digital information, all digital tech um, media at digital format is in ones and zeros in that binary format. You've got technological convergence, and this means the um, convergence of different types of information into a single delivery system. Text, photograph, film, video, voices, music, all available through a single delivery system. Whether that be your smart TV, your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone, your watch, whatever it might be. Boyle in 2005 notes that digitization allows information to be delivered across a range of media platforms that were once separate and unconnected. So, for example, it is now possible to watch television, films on your phone. Um, I think you can do it on your watch as well, but I'm not sure on that one. Um, it's possible to look at a map or use GPS using your phone and listen and download music via your watch or your phone or your tablet. You can have one device that does it all. Bit Lord of the Rings there, but it is about moving multiple devices to a or multiple media formats to a single delivery system. It's also economic convergence. 
And this is where media and telecommunication industries who once would focus and specialize in a specific type of media are now um, expanding into more areas. A good example here is Virgin. Not only do you have Virgin TV, you have Virgin phones, you have Virgin Internet, along with all the other areas of Virgin, that Virgin is involved in. It's also led to economic alliances between companies to provide digitization. Um, it's removed boundaries between media sectors. It's allowed the cross fertilization, as Boyle notes, of ideas and resources and provided and produced new forms of converged multimedia delivery systems. So again, we're talking about those streaming services that are now offering interactivity. You've got streaming services that provide live sports where you can choose the view by which you watch those sporting events. You've also got cultural convergence, and this comes from Jenkins, who notes that the media has has produced cultural convergence because it's changed the way that media members of society interact with both media and each other. For example, the new media have changed the nature of consumerism, meaning that we now don't necessarily have to go to a shop to buy things. We can do it on our phones. We can do it on a computer. We can do it via an Alexa. For example, my sister does her shopping list throughout the week. She will just tell Alexa to add some, a particular thing to the shopping list. And then on a Friday, that order gets placed with whichever supermarket she's using for delivery on Saturday. Um, so she doesn't have to go and do her big weekly family shop. It's all done digitally. Um, you've also got new ways that people interact with each other. A report by Ofcom in 2014 found that Facebook remains the default social networking site for 96% of UK adults. Now, I think that has dropped considerably um, with various issues that have happened since 2014 regarding Facebook. But the point still stands. We now communicate more readily and more um, commonly through digital formats rather than face to face communication. I personally use WhatsApp as that is my preferred means of communication or Twitter. Um, I prefer that over talking to people face to face. The next characteristic we've already talked about a little bit is interactivity. New media allows the um, viewer, the um, user to interact with their media in real time by using clicks on links, menu, drop down menus, select, as I said, with these new interactive movies where you select what happens next. Um, you, we can download a book to read on a Kindle or an e-reader in seconds. So we are now able to interact more readily with the media that we're consuming and we're also able to interact more readily with the producers of those medias authors who are on social media who interact with their readers you um actors and actresses who are on social media interacting with their viewers so that even through social media you can ask questions in tv shows you can um I think I can't remember if this is correct, but certain reality TV shows will have a live stream of Twitter comments through the show. So people are able to put their views in in real time. New media also provides choice. And again, we're back with Jenkins here, who argues that media audiences today can interact with a variety of media using a single device in search of entertainment, information, social relationships and services. This means that new media audiences have a greater degree of choice compared to, say, the early 90s in terms of how they access their media. Pers at home, I don't tend to watch television in terms of traditional television. I stream everything through um, 
tablets and Amazon Fire Sticks and things like that. I prefer streaming services because they don't have adverts. Um, Boyle notes that the society use of television has evolved from a simple supply led um, system where we watched whatever the television channels decided to put on when they decided to put it on to a demand led system where we can now have um, Sky Plus and all of these other similar services where we can choose when we want to watch the programs that are on television. So viewers are no longer constrained by television schedules. Yes, there is live TV and if you want to watch it live, you watch it when it's on. But at the same time, you can watch on catch up or plus one if you're not able to watch it at that particular time. Or if you have a clash in shows where one's on one channel and one's on the other channel and they're on at the same time, you can choose to watch one and record the other. You've also got participatory culture. So new media means that the um, audiences are no longer passive receivers of entertainment, knowledge, information. Instead, they often collaborate with new media and other users by uploading content themselves. Think YouTube, Facebook, uh, TED Talks, sharing music files, writing reviews on consumer um, sites. That's what I was looking for, sites. Um, and or even doing review videos on YouTube of films and television shows that are coming out or new games. You've got Twitch where people will live stream them playing games. So um, we can share opinions via Reddit and through um, Twitter and things like that. Jenkins argues that the convergence of interactivity and um, convergence have produced this participatory culture where the producers and consumers are no longer separate roles. They are actually intertwined and interconnected with each other and have forced new rules regarding what is offered in terms of media. And finally, you've got collective intelligence. Jenkins uses the term collective intelligence as a result of participatory culture. He notes, and this is a quote, none of us can know everything. Each of us knows something and we can put all the pieces together if we pool our resources and combine our skills. And the new media allows us to do that. He says that new media users challenge traditional and official ways of seeing things. So we could link this back to um, postmodernist ideas of the breakdown of meta narratives. We've got new way Jenkins claims that new media content is an alternative user led source of information that is often critical of more official streams of information and traditional forms of information. So information sharing has is no longer a top down process. It is in fact a collective process. So we're moving on now to look at the users of new media. And this data is a little bit out of date. I have tried to find new data, more up to date data and haven't been successful in doing that. Um, if I do, I will, will update. But Ofcom has done research into how people have changed their use of the media between 2005 and 2015. So they conducted the survey in 2005 and did it exactly the same again in 2015 to see what had changed. So this is a good example of a reliable survey and Ofcom being a government um, body, these are a form of official statistics. So what did they find? They found that between 2005 and 2015, Adult usage of the Internet had gone up by 30 percent. They found that 69 percent of people access the Internet via a smart device, a phone or a watch. That the hours of Internet use had doubled 
to 20 hours per week in that 10 year period. Now, we're probably going to have seen that doubled again since then, particularly during COVID when um, we were all at home, we couldn't go out and do things. You had online learning, remote work, where people would have using the internet much, much more. In that 10 year period, texting had become the f preferred form of social contact. Now we could say that that has that now evolved to more instant messaging, WhatsApp, um, DMs, Twitter, and things like that. But we're still seeing that more separated form of um, communication rather than face-to-face -face communication. Seven in 10 people had at least one social media profile. So they're not specifying which particular social media, probably 2015, it was likely um, Facebook was the most common one, but people are moving to threads, to Instagram, to X or Twitter. I'm still gonna call it Twitter, I'm sorry. Um, to Snapchat, Instagram. And people were preferring to create their own TV schedules. And that has only increased in the last 10 years since 2015. People now no longer generally buy a TV guide and find out what's on and when. They will just watch it on catch up or set their devices to record. And finally, consumption of short form user generated platforms had increased by 68%. YouTube, TED Talks, um, Instagram, uh, TikTok, or people's attention span. They much prefer shorter videos, she says, making a long um, lecture video, shorter videos than uh, longer TV shows and movies. So the use of new media has increased and it only continues to do so as new media formats come out. So how do, who, particularly is using the media. This can be broken down into four groups. So we're looking at the generational divide, the class divide, the gender divide, and the global divide. When we're talking about the gender divide, we're looking at how different age groups use new media. And Boyle notes that new media is often associated with the young. And some sociologists have suggested that there is a huge generational divide between the young and the older um, generations in terms of their use of new media. An example for um, done by um, Ofcom suggested that 12 to 15 year olds are more likely than adults to be engaged in some form of cross media multitasking. And what they mean by that is things like texting friends while browsing several websites, or having multiple tabs open in their browsers, watching TV whilst doing homework, streaming music whilst playing games, having conversations with people within the games that they are playing. And this survey suggests that as people get older, this kind of cross media multitasking declines with um, older groups who are still engaging in online activities tending to be more singular in their focus. Boyle argues that there is no doubt that the media experience of young people is growing in the UK. Um, in 2015 it is remarkably different to previous generations because that generation, your generation, has grown up with these medias. So for example, when I was 15, back in the 90s, my school had one computer that had the internet on it. Mobile phones were not a thing unless you were really rich. Even then, the it was only the middle classes and the upper classes who had pages. Most people did not have access to digitized technology. However, today, if you're asked in lessons, pretty much every member of the class will have some form of smartphone. Um, so what we're talking about here is the new media in the in terms of internet, social networking sites are considered now media and they're significantly different 
um, from previous media because of their immediacy and accessibility. So the way that young people access and seek out entertainment is vastly different to previous generations. I remember growing up where we would get the TV guide and we'd go through and we'd highlight which TV shows we wanted to watch. And you had to get in there quick to make sure that you got to watch the TV shows that you wanted to watch before somebody else had picked something else to watch at that particular time. Now you can go off and watch what you want to watch on your tablet, on your computer, on your, t on your own TV without that impacting others in the household. Um, Whereas older people, adults, um, become, tend to become a little bit more anxious about how young people are using the media. And, um, and we, you see it often, people calling for the bans of mobile phones in schools and the careful access that we give young people to technology and to these medias. Um, and it's not just these new anxieties, but also they've amplified traditional concerns that have led to more anxiety. The accessing of pornography, terrorist propaganda, bullying, grooming have all become a lot more um, prominent with new media. So when we're looking at that generational divide, young people to summarize young people are more likely to be using cross media multitasking tools young people are more likely to see the benefits of technology and new media whereas older generations are becoming more anxious about young people use and they tend to use their um technology and new media as in a more singular format now the class divide is one that has been mentioned before and particularly became prominent during COVID when it became very clear about this class divide in access to new media. Ofcom surveys indicate that although a class divide has narrowed in recent years, it still exists, whereby working class families may have access to new media, but it tends to be on a familial level. So rather than everybody in the household having their own devices, having multiple smart TVs throughout the house, they would tend to have one device or two devices that are shared between members of the household. Whereas those who are in the more affluent socioeconomic groups tend to have more individualized devices where each member of the household may have a tablet or a phone or a watch or multiple devices that they can use. During COVID, we found that um, that digital divide was very, very prominent with households with multiple children trying to share devices in order to engage with online learning, whilst parents are also trying to use those devices for remote learning. Helpser in 2011 claimed that despite the narrowing of the class divide, a digital underclass has emerged, characterised by unemployment low educational levels and low digital skills. The evidence suggests that this group has increased its use of internet at a much slower rate than others, looking to use more public service access rather than privatised access. And those members of this group that do have internet access rate their skills as poorer than the more educated group. So when it comes to new media, it is those people who are in the lower socioeconomic backgrounds who tend to be the less skilled users of new media. When we look at the gender divide, we've got Lee and Kirkup found that there were significant differences between men and women in how they used media technology. Men were more likely than women to use email and chat rooms and play computer games such as Xbox than women did. However, in 2015, Ofcom reported that men were more likely to access the internet, with men accessing 23 hours per week compared to 17 from women, and women are more likely to go than men to go online to look at social media sites. 67% of women compared to 60% of women. So 
it's not that men and women are using uh, have different access to this new media it's just the use of new media tends to be different the Inter internet advertising bureau conducted a uh, research in 2014 that suggests that women are now account for 52 percent of those who play digital games but these games tend to be solo games so more kind of like your games on your phone your um farmville type games than those than men who tend to play more interactive games on things such as xbox playstation and the wii um the iab survey found that mobile puzzle games such as candy crush and angry birds were particularly attractive to females because they were free intuitive accessible and didn't require much learning time in order to get good at the game however olsen in 2008 found boys were more likely to play violent video games because they wanted to express pa um, fantasies of power and glory and to master exciting realistic environments so this could be linked to crisis of masculinity where they are finding new ways to exert what is considered traditional masculinity um, which they're not being able to do through workplace or through educational background Hartman and Klimit in 2006 found women gamers generally disliked video violent video content and preferred more um, social interaction of games um, and Royce in 2007 found that female gamers tend to play between five and ten hours a week whereas men tended to be much much more so the use of new media in terms of gender tends to be in their use of media and what they're trying to get out of the media rather than their actual accessibility to media now in terms of the global divide what we're seeing here is the world economic forum the wef said that there is a major massive digital divide between developing and developed nations with the least developed countries worsening in their access to new media according to the world bank in 2012 about three quarters of the world's population had access to a mobile phone and there are six billion mobile phones in use worldwide now considering the fact that our world population is eight billion that's an impressive number of mobile phones in use and they are they found that almost five billion of those mobile phones were being used in developing countries mobile phone use has spread particularly quickly in africa now i remember i went on a holiday one year to and did a sahara trek across the sahara desert and i was amazed at how good my mobile phone um connectivity was during my time in the middle of the Sahara Desert. But a lot of nomadic tribes who are still nomadic within the Sahara, within other areas of developing nations, have found that mobile phone use has helped them to stay connected. So we are seeing a growth in mobile phone use in those developing nations. In 2014, the GSMA estimated that 72% of Africans use uh, of african use of mobile phones but this fact creates a false impression of digital revolution so what they're saying is yes 72 percent of africans do have a mobile phone but that doesn't mean that it is a smartphone it might be a traditional phone a mobile phone that you can call text and play snake on um of that 72 percent only 18 percent were smartphones and there are major regional disparities in access to mobile phones for example in eritrea only five percent of the population has mobile phones um so when we're looking at that digital divide we get a full sense of digitization around the world because in some areas that digital revolution hasn't been as prominent now we move on to the debates on new media and the biggest debate in new media is 
whether or not the development of new media is a good thing or not. Curran and Seaton identified two perspectives relating to the debate on new media. The neophilics, who are optimistic, neophilic, not necrophilic, that's something completely different, and the cultural pessimists who take a rather negative view on the role of new media. So we're going to look at the neophilic perspective first and then the cultural pessimist debate um, view. So for the neophilics, new media is beneficial to society. They see society that the, the new media and digitization has benefited society. So they're taking a very positive view and they give a number of reasons for this positivity. The first thing they point out is the increased consumer choice. They argue that it's con the convergence and interactivity that, new that characterizes new media have meant that consumers of new media, consumers of products have much more choice. There are now literally hundreds of entertainment channels, news channels, television channels, movie channels, music streaming services, user generated sites, and people can choose which type of media they are going to consume. Moreover, people can, can, can choose from a number of different systems. Some people prefer to buy, buy when it comes to music, you can buy vinyl, you can buy cassette, you can buy a CD, you can buy a, excuse me, a digital download. You can stream your music digitally. Um, you can play it through your phone, through your computer, through an Alexa or a Siri or any other form of interactive device. So we're not just talking about the fact that we have choice of lots of different types of media. We have choice on our preferred way of receiving that media. And that is a good thing because it creates competition. And we're getting very capitalist here. The more competition there is, it means that those uh, producers of media have to up their game because they have to compete for people to use their services. The neophilics also talk about the e-commerce revolution. So the Internet has created a new form of commerce, e-commerce, electronic commerce, with retailers such as um, Amazon and eBay and um, Etsy, Timu, um, Wish. All of these sites do not have a physical shop that you can walk into. You can only access their products through the Internet, through a digital device. And um, although these have undermined traditional high street sales of books, films and music, we've seen the closing of HMV, of Woolworths, of places where people would record shops, where people would go and buy these media. They have created um, this trend of more choice for consumers, increased competition, lower prices, and it's put the consumer in control because they can now compare prices. And we've even got websites that do it for us. Compare the market dot com where you can compare insurance quotes without having to ring around lots and lots of different companies to find the best price. There are comparison websites where you type in what you want to buy and it will show you all the different um, places you can buy it and how much it costs, putting the control into the consumer's hand. They also, Neophilix also argue that new media has revitalized democracy. New media offers new opportunities and more opportunities for people to acquire education and information so that they can take part in the democratic system. And it has made politicians more accountable to the people because they are no longer 
on these lofty pedestals of government in Parliament, in the House of Commons or whatever, they are actually having to interact with the electorate and deal with the fact that the, the, it is an immediacy. Recently, there were comments made by Gillian Keegan, the current um, education minister, that really did not put her in a good light and she had to make a formal apology. But no longer could can they cultivate the message that they're putting out there in the same way because it is live and it is immediate. They don't necessarily have time to sit there and go through a, a speech or go through a written document and say a a a pre-written script. So it has made the politicians far more accountable. And the internet particularly has highlighted that the people because it's in the public sphere, sphere, anyone can access literally at little or no cost the information they require to compare viewpoints. They're no longer reliant on um, media companies telling them this is what you should know because they can go out and find it themselves. Seaton notes that many also believe that the internet is advancing progressive technology uh, politics. He quote, internet technology converts the desk into the printing press, broadcasting station and place of assembly. This enables many to many communication, which has changed the way we do politics. In this, it, which, um, sorry, in this view, sorry, this is still the quote, in this view, the net is rejuvenating civil society, generating political activism and launching exciting experiments of popular participation in government. Establishing centres of power and monopolies of communications are being bypassed and a process of progressive mobilisation is underway that will empower people. And what he's saying here is, People from behind their computer screen can create a movement. And we have seen that with Black Lives Matters. We've seen that with the Me Too campaigns, with He For She, with all of these campaigns that have come up in recent years. They started with somebody creating a message or creating a post from their computer screen, from their desk at home. Some neophiliacs are part of an anti-global capitalism movement that the internet, that have used the internet to challenge the powerful elites. Itzu, I-T-Z-O-E, argues that the internet is a loose and anarchic confederation of millions of users around the world who communicate in perhaps the freest form of speech in history. So the internet can be used for a variety of political ways by activists to monitor illegal and immoral activities of big business, to harness mass support for causes such as Make Poverty History, Black Lives Matters, Me Too and He For She, and coordinate protesters and activists ranging from hunt saboteurs, anti-vivisectionists, anti-austerity protesters, disruptions of global um, meetings and global summits. And you've got groups such as hacktivist networks, such as Anonymous, who have disrupted government um, websites. They've um, created web sit-ins where they, where they send so much information to a website, it crashes. Um, they have become involved in um, legal campaigns. There were, the Anonymous were involved in a situation where a town in America tried to cover up a mass rape of a high school student by football players. And Anonymous got involved and said, basically, either you arrest the guys that did this and actually prosecute them, or we are start, going to start releasing information. Um, as they had access to a lot of powerful people's information. Now, the last part of um, the 
neophiliacs view and I've kind of touched on this already is they like they feel that new media has given us access to more information they've found that we now have so much information available to us that we are more informed but that doesn't mean that this is a good thing so for example the increased consumer choice can lead to choice apathy I'm sure you've sat in front of a computer uh, in front of the TV flicking through all the channels going there's nothing to watch because there's so much choice your brain's just going can't do it not going to make a choice and you just end up flicking through the e-commerce revolution has led to the closing of high street shops and of high street consumerism people don't necessarily go out to buy things anymore and the access to information has led to too much information where you have groups of people now who are going there's too much out there i don't know what to believe i'm just going to ignore it or fake information where people are fed fake news and um, disinformation to disrupt their viewpoints so as much as these new medias have these benefits they do come with negatives as well and that brings us on to the cultural pessimists view who believe that the benefits and the revol the new media revolution is exaggerated they believe that all those wonderful things that the neophilics point out about new media perhaps they're not quite as good as we think they are the first thing they point out is that new media is not so new. Cornford and Robbins argue that old technology, as it's sometimes for, called, such as television and telephone landlines, are still an integral part to new media. We wouldn't have the new media if these old technologies didn't exist and are still used. Okay. In order to get broadband internet in your home, even though it's Wi-Fi, you still have to have a phone line. That's how it reaches your router to give you the Wi-Fi. Um, they suggest further that interactivity is not something new just because people have always written to newspapers. They've phoned into radio and television shows for years. They, uh, the only thing that is new about this is its speed. Whereas before, if they did a, a Saturday night competition um, on a Saturday night TV show, think Ant and Dex, Saturday night takeaway, I think that's still a show, I'm not sure. Um, whereas now that is done all in one week, previously you would ring in and a week later they would announce the winners. Um, the most convincing example of this real time um, information sharing that is not quite as new as we think it is is was in 9 11 when people watched live as the planes hit the twin towers now yes that live element of it is new however the dissemination of that information worldwide is not it would have been previously it would have happened and then obviously for those who were not in New York or um, America at the time, that would have then been disseminated more wildly, widely later in the day. They also argue the, about the validity of information and that the information that we're being sent is not necessarily accurate. Just because there is more of it doesn't mean it's truthful and it means that people are having to um, work harder to try and bring truth to it they're, they're having to cross check the information just because somebody says it online doesn't make it true the number of times we've seen it trending that a celebrity has passed away and then the celebrity pops up and goes, no, I'm still alive. I'm still here. They've also argued that new media is a threat to democracy rather than it being a 
benefit to democracy is actually threatening democracy um, because it is causing people to get to challenge people um, and they argue that the view that media Cornford and Robin sorry argue that the new media leading to more democratic communications is actually false they note that through a series of tactics alliances mergers takeovers licensing deals etc media corporations have monopolized key strategic links within the media so all the free speech that um, the neophilics say that we have gained through new media perhaps isn't as free as we think it is um, there is also a lack of regulation and the, ne the um, cultural pessimists argue that the new media particularly the internet is in need of regulation there is nothing stopping anyone from uploading anything to the internet and we've seen this through videos of executions that have been posted through um sites that are dedicated to revenge porn that all of these things there is no regulation stopping anyone from um putting anything on the internet so it's argued that there should be some form of regulation over the new media and oh sorry okay we go powerpoint's gone a little bit weird it's also argued that we have become by turkle that we media users have become cyborg users and what he means by this is that we are so connected to re each other regardless of where we are via the internet laptops and all the rest of it that people now live full time on the web and devoted and are devoted to their communication devices now there is in fact a subculture in japan i think it is of online users online people they don't leave their rooms they, they live in very very small rooms and they live their entire lives online they work online they socialize online they shop online they order food online to be delivered to their doors so they never ever leave their homes and they are connected 24 7. now me personally i'm probably quite similar to that if i'm awake my devices are on um so we we now have moved away from talking about how many real world friends we have to how many um followers we have on twitter how many friends we've got on social media livingston argues did a similar analysis to truckle um, and found that children today communicate more virtually than they um than they do with their own families parents often text or facebook chat their children to get their attention at meal times now i know that i have heard of situations like this where when i was younger my parents would just shout up to us to tell us to come down to dinner these days a text message is sent can you come down for dinner and finally we've got new media as chaos Keen in 2008 is very critical of aspects of new media particularly the internet he claims they are chaotic he claims there is no moral code uh, within the internet and it is a place where truth is selective and this leads back to that lack of reg um, regulation he identifies four areas that he's particularly critical of in terms of new media he he is critical of social networking sites such as facebook which do not contribute to the democratic process in any way because they're merely vehicles for narcissistic self-broadcasting and you we know what we mean by this is people put their best lives online you, you those instagrammers and influencers who kind of do those photos of oh i woke up like this no you didn't you spent an hour getting the lighting right getting your colors right and all of that before you posted that 
picture. He's also critical of user generated sites such as Wikipedia and YouTube, which are open to abuse and bias. Consequently, they are unreliable sources of information. And we've become a, a, a generation of cut and paste plagiarists and intellectual thieves. So instead of taking this information, absorbing it, understanding it and learning it, we're just using what somebody else has written. And he, he would argue the role of the, what we're seeing currently with um, ChatGTP and the use of AI, it's getting worse. He also is um, critical of the output of new media, such as Twitter and blogs being unchecked and cons consequently uninformed opinions, lies, trolling, rather than expert analysis and expertise. So when we jump onto YouTube and watch one of those um, videos that people create, we're getting what we're getting is opinion. We're not necessarily getting considered analysis and expertise, yet people are viewing it. Oh, it's on the internet. It must be from an expert. It must be expertise. And Keane finally argues that the internet is contributing to cultural illiteracy. He claims that young people are less actively engaged with researching the world around them because the internet is there and it just provides the facts. Consequently, young people have young, shorter attention spans and poorer problem solving skills because everything is there for them. So those are the debates. So we've gone over the what is new media, the trends and um, the development of new media and characteristics. We've talked about the divide in users of new media and the debates regarding whether new media is a good thing or a bad thing. This was rather a long video, I apologise, but we got there in the end.